Hello, welcome to A Plan For That, a space for progressives to pitch in their two cents on the wild news cycle, meet with leaders and activists, and build a plan to elect an army of progressives. My name is Vince. I'm a recovering journalist out here in the Rocky Mountain West who has spent years on the fringes of the democratic establishment, working within the system and especially outside of the system to advance progressive politics and policy. With me, as always, is my favorite co-host, Aaron. Hey, guys, I'm Aaron. Erin, I am a recently activated activist and a lightning bolt of energy that demands progressive change. I'm not backing down, and hey, let's bring the crowd. Demands is an understatement. Everybody, if you are not already following Erin on Twitter, it is wellness, the number four. You, 13, go get at her because right there you can see how much she demands and advances all of this progressive policy. Whew, there's a lot going on this week, Erin. I just... I'm going to catch my breath for a second and ask you how you are doing. Oh, Vince, I hear you. From the unbelievable sham of a SCOTUS hearing uh, to people, you know, planning to kidnap and, and, and worse, murder. They, they were actually contemplating murdering uh, uh, Democratic governors to uh, Virginia's election machines for voter registration. Just, you know, whoops, don't work today because somebody accidentally cut the cord. I have to ask you, Vince, how do you accidentally cut something? You know, I, uh, I've, I've certain. I mean, unless I was already in the process of cutting something else, it's never happened. I hear ya. I accidentally, <laughs> quote unquote, cut my hair and then said it was the dog's hair when I was, you know, three. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that is just so much going on this week, though. The Supreme Court nomination hearing has been absorbing so much of my attention that I had not even heard about Virginia until this morning when you were cluing me into all of it. And um, and I mean, over the weekend here in Colorado, we unfortunately had a lot of excitement with a uh, a, a right wing activist was shot by a, Pink a Pinkerton security guard for a uh, an NBC affiliate news person um, at a back the blue pro police rally. And uh, man, did that, that absorb so much of my time that I'm almost grateful to just talk about something normal like Republican voter suppression this week. You know, I, I hear you, Vince, and I just, we're in trouble, y'all. <laughs> we need to make sure that we continue to force um, the idea of police complete accountability and qualified immunity. Thank you, Elizabeth Warren. Absolutely. And we're only going to get there by, you know, advancing progressive politics and politicians. So let's get down to what's really happening this week. And I do want to spend just a quick moment talking about the sham of a Supreme Court nomination hearing right now. Um, whatever else is going on, I keep focusing in on her absolute refusal, at least at this point in recording. We're recording at 2.30 in the afternoon, uh, mountain time on Tuesday. Um, so things might have changed by the time you're hearing this. Uh, she has absolutely refused to say that she will recuse herself from uh, any, any, any trial that has any outcome on the next ele presidential election, despite President Trump outwardly and openly saying that he is appointing her to make sure that she makes sure that he wins the election, which, I mean, just for the sake of the court's sake, she needs to recuse herself despite anything else there, right? Uh, you would think so, Vince. And honestly, this this is where we have to kind of applaud the stupidity of the Trump publicans because they're at least saying the quiet part out loud now, right? I mean, the court is actually just a dark money funded organization at this point. And I can't wait to hear from a good friend of ours, Joe Spaulding, as we uncover the mysteries of the evil of the machine of DeVos and the Koch brothers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Post-election, it's going to be all about knowing thy enemy, and I cannot wait to have Joe, friend of the show, back on to uh, to really help us feel out who we're going to be fighting against, because no matter what the outcome of this presidential election is, you better believe that this current wave of politics is not over yet. We're building for November 4th and well beyond. In fact, Chuck Grassley, conveniently enough, gave away the secret today. If people don't like what we do, they can vote us out of office. 
Yeah, you know what, Chuck? That's just great. Except for the part where you, according to plan, are trying to suppress voters all around the nation with failing election machines, failing voter registration websites. Oh, and did we mention an 11 hour wait to vote in Georgia, y'all? That was ridiculous. I have to give a shout out, Vince, to the World Kitchen and Pizza to the Polls. These are two organizations that are at least going to feed people while they have their democracy attacked by the Republicans as they stand in line for hours on end to wait. I ordered a pizza for the polls this morning as soon as Aaron told me that that was going on because hearing about these people waiting all, it's going to happen all over the country for the next couple of weeks. People waiting in hours and hours amid a pandemic uh, to, to be able to cast their ballot and vote. And I can't believe how out in the open it is now. Um, I'm remembering back to 2012 when it took me seven hours in three different polling locations to go vote in person for Barack Obama in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and the ease of my ballot that I'm, I'm, I'm holding up and showing Aaron right now, it's in my hand here in Colorado. I'm going to go drop it in a ballot box this evening. Um, and it's, and it's just so much easier in some places and so much harder in others. Uh, voter suppression is the name of the game on a plan for that all throughout this week. Um, and let's uh, let's do a quick survey of what's really going around uh, the country in the in the open ways that they're playing offense to, uh, you know, keep us out in a way. All right, listeners. So you heard Vince. It's not just one. It's not just two. There's an entire list of areas where people are uh, experiencing long lines. I know that in Texas, the governor has decided that there should only be one secure drop box. Just one. Everyone has to find it all throughout the county. Just one. That's it. Everything's um, bigger in Texas, even the hunt to cast your ballot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or or the size of the corruption. Um, and I want to <laughs> Give, I want to give a shameless plug here to vote blue for Texas. Today is the first day for early voting Texas. Texas, you look better in blue. We like you in blue. Go MJ Hagar. <laughs> All right, where else are we waiting in line? So Georgia, we already mentioned, of course, those poor souls in Georgia. And again, I want to give a shout out to the World Kitchen, Chef Jose Andreas who you may notice um, from all of the stories, literally anytime there's a disaster, he is there. He is there feeding first responders, feeding victims, feeding people who are left in a shambles after hurricanes, national disasters, and yes, uh, our sham of a democracy where people have to wait in line for hours and hours to vote. We're going to hear a lot of this over the next few months or months, weeks, um, about people who are who are going to have to make the difficult choice about uh, when and how and where they're going to be able to cast their ballot. Um, we're Later in the show, we're going to talk about the dangers of voting on um, electronic voting machines in 2020. But even paper ballots, which I trust and I love, California Republicans are finding a way to, uh, you know, at least create a little bit of distrust in that system. Yeah, they're just doing super. And I can't help but think that this is all part of the plan, according to Donald Trump. How to cause chaos, stir disbelief, and unrest around the 2020 election because he is losing. He's losing. He faces prison and other things after his loss. He knows it. He fears it. This is what's at stake. Everybody get out there and vote. I don't care how long you have to wait. We will get you a pizza. We will absolutely get you a pizza at any polling place where you are at because it is true. Donald Trump, his politics, his party, they are losers in 2020. They were losers in 2018, and we are seeing the desperation here at the finish line. They are, you know, putting up. I mean, they're literally stealing mailboxes. And in some places, while they're building fake polling places and others, they're kidnapping governors. They are training people to intimidate at polling locations. And really, we have to remember that, you know, be brave, be out there, be voting. That's exactly right. And while I have been volunteering my mm, off, as my little guy would say, um, I am going to say that. Aside from volunteering, I did take a quick break, a quick enough break, to see that Amy Coney Barrett won't even say that the president has zero ability to delay elections. Zero. Okay? So media pundits everywhere, get your heads out of your 
and stop saying that he does have that option. We are going to turn this show X-rated if we have to, and I'm not kidding. It is getting so, so close. So we're going to take a second, and we'll even let a little bit of air out. I want to go hear from Pam Keith in Florida about all the reasons you need to be supporting her. Stick around, guys. There's more fun ahead, and we could not be more excited, am I right, Vince, to talk to Jennifer Cohn, our election security advocate, writer, and freelance journalist, who is going to talk to us about our elections and their security, as well as the pitfalls. Trump has dismantled America's reputation and enablers like Brian Mast helped him do it. He say alienate nos amis et say aplati devant nos enemies. Su alianza con Putin coloca nuestra seguridad nacional en riesgo. Y ahora el mundo se compadece de nosotros. I'm Pam Keith. Navy vet and daughter of a U.S. ambassador. I approve this message because the next Congress will have to repair America's reputation. We're the good guys. Let's act like it. I am so excited to have Jennifer Cohn today with us, who is an election security advocate, writer, and freelance journalist. Her background is quite impressive. She is a graduate of the University of California, Los Angeles, and Hastings College of Law. She has been a law partner at Nielsen Haley and Abbott in Marin County for many years, and she has specialized in insurance coverage and civil appeals. Her focus since 2016 has been exclusively on investigating and exposing our country's insecure computerized elections. She does have ideas on how to make this better. Jenny, we can't wait to hear from you. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me onto your show. It's great to be here. Absolutely. And during the break, I know that you and Vince and I were talking about some of the things that were noticed. Did you want to let our listeners know what we're seeing with these computerized election machines? Well, in Georgia, I mean, at least for the first day of voting, we saw some really, really long lines. And Georgia is the first state, I think, or one of the first, to deploy this new generation of touchscreen voting machines statewide, uh, one of the first. And even when touchscreen voting machines don't malfunction, they have a propensity to cause long lines because they necessarily limit the number of voters who can vote concurrently to the number of touchscreen machines allocated to that polling place. And it's very different than if you use a hand-marked paper, a pen and paper to mark your ballot, mark your choices, where you can scale up very easily if if the lines get long. You can have really almost an unlimited number of people filling out their ballots at the same time. And so we're seeing long lines in Georgia. They absolutely, I think, could have been mitigated had they not insisted on using touch screens to mark people's ballots for all in-person voters. But they insisted on it. There were some glitches having to do mostly, I think, with the electronic poll books, which are the check-in computers. But they do overlap with these touchscreen voting machines in the sense that they are using them to not only confirm voter registrations and that voters have not already voted previously, but also to encode the activation cards for these new touchscreen voting machines. So if the electronic poll books aren't working properly, the whole thing screeches to a halt. And um, I've been worried about that because the electronic poll books have, um, I mean, in the abstract, I was worried about them kind of equally in what we were seeing so far is that the e-poll books are even glitchier than the touch screens. So, um, so yeah, we're seeing long lines. I think they're not going to be quite as long today, but what's kind of going to be maybe unfortunate is that, you know, they reached up to 12 hours yesterday. So of course, anything's going to look like no big deal. Oh, there were only three hours or two hours. And that's not really great either. Intentionally setting the bar very low so they can leap over it, but continue to, and and, and especially when they're going to measure it in averages across the state as well. It's like, oh, in some places, the lines continue to be eight hours. But look, in this community, it's only 20 minutes because they have 37 machines. Right. Um, And it's hard to, that the problem with this is that the machines themselves well, the whole thing is not as transparent and easy to get a handle on as, as one would like. And you do have to look at historical context here where non-white voters are seven times more likely than white voters to wait in line for more than an hour to vote. That's a wild statistic. <laughs> that is just, honestly, that that is just unfair and it needs to stop. It really does. 
Um, And I have actually a personal story for you guys, listeners, about this. Um, During the primary, I voted for Elizabeth Warren, (laughs) and it marked Mike Bloomberg. I did not touch Mike Bloomberg, and I did halt my voting process to bring a judge over. But Jenny, what, what should people do if they experience something like that rare glitch? I mean, I do, you absolutely did the right thing. You call over the poll worker. I would make sure to make a written report that there's a written report of it with your name and number so you can be contacted, um, made to the county. And I also am really encouraging people to use a tool that I only became aware of probably a few weeks ago. It's called csay2020.com. And it's spelled S-E-E-S-A-Y. The idea is see something, say something. And what it is, is a public interactive map and it, people can, it has a a form that you fill out and you can report incidents to it and they will put it on their map and for anyone to look at. And they also will um, keep your data, your your contact information private, but they ask if you were willing to be contacted by lawyers or campaigns later on for, you know, if you would sign basically an affidavit to affirm what happened. And this way we can actually quantify some of these incidents and use them as evidence in election challenges if we need to. It's really a missing piece that we didn't have before. Yeah, it seems, I, I'm finding myself thinking back through every every ballot I've ever cast, every vote I've ever made. In Pennsylvania, I voted on paper in my first one, but then I did use a, a touchscreen voting machine years and years and years ago. Uh, and, and now it seems so 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 foreign to me. I, I'm all I'm all the way out in Colorado where it's been paper ballot and mail ballot the entire time that I've been here, and uh, I, I I I hadn't thought about um, this, this this little tiny detail of voting that you mentioned when we were uh, in the green room before we came on the show. The importance of bringing your sample ballot to the actual voting machine because honestly, in my entire life. Um, I'm 32 years old. Uh, when I was 18 is when I was voting on a machine. I, I didn't think that it would be different. I never considered that that could be an actual reality. So there was a study out of the University of Michigan this year that showed that voters miss 93% of inaccuracies on the paper record of voter intent that is generated by this new generation of touchscreen voting machines. And this was actually quite consistent with previous studies on the older generation of touch screens that marked a piece of paper for you too. And that's a problem. It's actually kind of an invitation for fraud and also for error, especially as to down ballot races, which are, you know, we're so focused on the presidency. I am too. And I have to keep reminding myself that we really need to be on alert for anything amiss with down ballot races as well. And if you bring your, this study showed that it really did not, voters' ability to notice deletions or changes did not really increase significantly, even if they were just instructed to verify that the printout is correct. That really didn't do it. The only thing that made a really big difference, and it did make a very big difference, was having them use a pre-filled slate or sample ballot to compare against the printout, and then they noticed. Was it, I wonder I wonder if that has anything to do with they had to sit down in, in advance of casting their live ballot and actually consciously think it out once before. So even those those, those moment of chance decisions that you might make for a, for a down ballot race, you might not be educated enough about, and you're you're kind of making that choice in the in the booth. I think a lot of it is these printouts often don't even put party affiliation. They're summaries. They're not the full ballot, so they they don't put party affiliation next to the name, and people often have it memorized. They voted for down ballot. They voted for a you know, Democrat or the Republican. So if you take that R or D away from it, or if you just say Proposition One, Two, Three, Four, Five, and you voted yes, no, 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 yes, who's going to have memorized what One, Two, Three, Four, Five is? And that's all that's showing on the printout when you look at it. Okay. So that's why we need. I mean, I hate to use the phrase cheat sheet, but that's sort of not in the real cheating way. You're trying to prevent cheating. Right? <laughs> or error but that's why you actually need your sample ballot to compare against that and there have been instances where races have been reported to be and or candidates have been reported to be deleted down race not tons of reports though i will say that but again 93 percent wouldn't notice anyway so or 93 of errors would not be noticed anyway so yes it's a it's a huge tip everyone should be talking about bringing your sample ballots to the polls you know you could even be given the wrong ballot quite frankly even if you were given a hand-marked paper ballot they 
in theory, your races could be deleted there. There was an incident of mail ballots omitting the presidency in California in Los Angeles County, oh, which is likely to be noticed at the top of the ballot, right? And it's also more likely to be noticed if it's mail ballots where people have more time to report it and kind of see that it's not just one person saying something. It's a lot of people, but it's always just a good time, to, good thing to double check. I mean, you use the term cheat sheet, and I, I, I know it's it's almost more like an open book, open net, open notes test. Um, as we're recording this, I'm sitting staring at my my ballot at, on top of the two blue books I have, one for the city and county of Denver and the other for the state of Colorado, because my ballot is probably 10 pages long. And I feel like I really do need to sit down and study it to, to, to get it right. And, and today we're talking all about transparency and just making the process as easy and as open to access and, and, and to vote um, as possible. And so it makes sense to bring your notes, be prepared to, to double check and triple check yourself. Exactly. That's a good way to put it. Bring your notes. So that, yes, that is a huge tip. Um, that is probably my number one tip right now. So what I'm hearing in in this larger conversation about transparency, Jenny, and I'm just so grateful that we have you together on our show today, um, is you need poll workers, you need poll watchers, so that someone can actually fill out a report, like perhaps what happened to me, or um, I think we've been hearing about reports of voter intimidation and electioneering even um, at voting locations. And I know that you have a whole slate of things that you would like to talk about as to how to fix all these problems with transparency. And listeners, that's what our show is. First, we talk about what's wrong, and then we talk about how to fix it on a plan for that. In general, because we do use machines to do to not only count the votes, but in many cases with these touch screens to mark them instead of using a pen to mark them as well. Um, it creates a lot of transparency concerns more than might otherwise be the case because machines are by definition opaque and you can't see the programming inside and you know, um, you don't know who programmed them, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so ideally what we would have had was uh, robust manual audits of a reliable record of voter intent, which would normally be a hand-marked paper ballot for every race. But the, the Republican Party blocked legislation that would have required that even just for the federal races, so we don't have that. And unfortunately, we can't really fix it. That would be overselling it, but there are lots of things we can do to mitigate, and that is sort of what I've been trying to promote is to mitigate the lack of transparency and bring as much light to it as we possibly can, both to protect against possible fraudulent results or erroneous results, and also to be able to defend ourselves against false claims of election fraud. So yes, one thing, I mean, I think even putting aside possible fraud, um, being a poll worker is, is huge because, well, for many reasons, but it also helps keep more polling places open which um, reduces the possibility of these really, really long lines. So uh, that is just hugely important. I've really been promoting uh, pollhero.org, which is Generation Z has been recruiting poll workers. When I first talked to them, they had 5,000. I think they're up to about 30,000 now. And um, they, do, they really kind of hold your hand through the process and they're great, but you can also contact your party, your um, county or, or state political party. And for the same reason, you can be a poll watcher. I actually was a poll watcher in the midterms, um, believe it or not. Yeah, first time. I just, I, I knew it was super important to do whatever you could to help. Um, so I walked petitions around for the first time to get candidates on the ballot. Um, took my little guy with me. Hint. It is very, very easy when you have a cute child. <laughs> um, and um, what I was told as a poll watcher, and, and, and I'm sure it varies depending on what area you're in, is that if anyone at any time is told that they are getting a provisional ballot, I need to be front and center taking a report exactly what you were referring to, I think, Jenny. Yes. Okay. Well, that's that's great. And so I do think poll watchers are very important. And I think we also need them just because we're hearing that Trump is sort of taking a page from Ukraine's playbook, by which I mean the sort of the pro-Russia faction in Ukraine, where they deployed um, a bunch of neo-Nazi thugs to the polls, I think in 2019, might have been 2018. And that's exactly what I think Trump is promoting, you know, with his Proud Boys. I don't want to put people in harm's way, but I think 
and I, I don't think it would, but I think we need to document everything. We need pictures. A uh, project that I am, well, I already mentioned csay2020.com that can bring a ton of transparency. It's, a, it's really an incredible tool. Just check out their website. It's amazing. Well, um, my, my group, protectourvotes.com, is working on this, and it's, it, you were looking at the precinct totals after the, so it's after the polls close. You go and photograph them. You can't do, take photographs before the polls close, but after in many places you can. And then you want to make sure that those totals at the precincts match the official results for those precincts. I was just going to say, this one always feels very personally, like super important to me because I remember the, um, the 2016 pri uh, presidential primaries. It was my first time caucusing in Colorado, which is wildly different than voting at a poll. Sure. But it was also my first time really bearing witness to human error in something that I had always really considered a an automated democratic process um, where there was disagreements in the rooms about how many hands were in the air because caucusing for those who have never been through that ordeal is literally like voting in person in a room with your community and it's and it, polling is way better vote 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 with ballots people um, right well the way that could happen here i mean there's a couple things going on so in the swing states they are unfortunately in florida michigan and wisconsin many of the counties uh, maybe all in some of those states are using wireless modems to transfer their precinct results to the county central tabulator and mm. That's a pro there's, there's the unofficial results that they're modeming. So they often will repeat the vendor talking points. They talk mostly to the vendors, which is it's no problem if anything went wrong. These are just the unofficial results. But what they're missing is that it's connecting both the scanners and the county central tabulators to the internet, which opens them, experts say, really unanimously, is dangerous and opens them up to potential hacking and can also be by corrupt insiders, by the way. <laughs> so we really need it. It, it. Ideally, we would have had these meaningful manual audits. We don't have them. Um, we don't even get meaningful manual recounts often, typically, because you get recounts only if automatically only if you're within less than a half a percent in most places. And then you have some states like Florida, where even if you're within that half a percent, it's not really a manual recount. It's a rescan. Um, experts say you have to have a manual, you know, hand count, hand re either a hand count with an audit, which isn't all the ballots, but a statistically meaningful sample or a full manual recount. So we need some other way to try to bring some light on it. And yes, photographing precinct totals and comparing them to reporting totals is a really important way to do that. And we have about 300 volunteers, but we need, you know, 10 times that many, I think, to really make a dent. And so protectourvotes.com, and it's it's actually really fun to do. We, we did it a bit in the primaries. It's a fun way to contribute and you learn a lot doing it too, just about how our elections are run, which is always a good thing. You know, honestly, I'm, I'm volunteering for nine campaigns and I, I still will, but your protectourvotes.com is next on my list. Like I, I wanna put that at the top of my, things to do because it, it sounds like that's literally the way that we're going to have the factual data that we need, right? Right. And I, I want to be clear though that unfortunately, even though if there is a mismatch, it can't you it proves that something is wrong. I mean there shouldn't be a mismatch. Um it is not enough probably to prove fraud. It, it proves a need to investigate. But it's often very difficult to even get past that hurdle of needing to investigate, needing a full manual recount or anything, because again, we have a, a system that puts the burden on campaigns or the public to prove that there's a need to investigate, but we don't have access to the evidence. It's the government and the vendors that have the access to the evidence, the officials, and some of, you know, you'd like to believe that everybody is not corrupt, but as we've learned from the last four years that we can't really make that, we can't afford to make that assumption anymore. and. Certainly there are some people who are corrupt. So what we do have access to in many cases is these poll tapes. And um, but yeah, it's a great project. There's another one, by the way. Um, so it's, it's sort of a new one, cooperation.org is two activists that I'm friends with, Golda Velez and Clint Curtis, and they're doing post-election affidavit audits. And this will require probably about four, 40 volunteers per precinct going to do it after the election, like maybe the next day or the day after, they will only target precincts which have significantly anomalous results in races that really mattered. And, you know, I'm thinking it would be very helpful to do that for a few precincts in somewhere like Georgia and Florida. And again, it's to get us over that hurdle where, 
otherwise we don't have access to the evidence. So we're, you know, creating our own evidence. And we're talking about these super specific places where we want to know the data, but for anybody listening, I mean, we are crowdsourcing the data to be able to combat something that we've for a long time not been able to know anything about. So wherever you are, this is an incredibly easy way to help the process coast to coast and to help shed some light and create transparency in the process is just, you know, photographing precinct totals and finding those small ways to, to, to help share information and help build it up so that we actually know what's going on for a change. Yeah, that's exactly right. Another great organization is scrutineers.org, and I'm a member and very friendly with the woman who's in charge of it. She's another friend of mine, and she is she's training volunteers or helping them to train themselves on a variety of different election protection issues with a focus toward transparency and secure election security like I have. So, for example, they have a Florida circle. We had found out that Florida according to a Brennan Center report, is one of the only swing states that does not require backup paper poll books for electronic check-in computers, those poll books that really seem to fall, uh, fail quite a bit. And so they are contacting literally every county in the state to in, in Florida to find out what their backup plan is and to see if they'll consider having backup paper poll books. And it's interesting work also because you, you learn a lot doing it. So for example, in Georgia, they actually claim to have backup, well, they had backup paper voter registration lists, which sounded fine and dandy, but as it turned out, it was useless because they weren't updated. So it's always the details and um, you know, so they're gonna make sure that they have actually updated electronic paper, I'm sorry, updated paper poll books in Florida. And if they have time elsewhere, which I think is just incredibly important because these poll books often connect to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and they're just very insecure. And, you know, they caused chaos in Los Angeles County and in Georgia in the primaries. And we can't, and, you know, they were breached by Russia. So apparently VR Systems is the company that provides Florida's e-poll books. So if anywhere should have the backups, it's them. And maybe they do, you know, maybe if they don't require it, so, but maybe they're doing it anyway. But again, they're, they're looking into it to bring some of that transparency and accountability. In addition to all of these organizations that I'm so grateful that you're bringing up so that all of our listeners can uh, join and volunteer for, um, I I think we should, going forward with the Biden-Harris administration, talk about a whole new raft of laws about election integrity and how how we're going to force that going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's really to the point, unfortunately, it's sort of to the point of name and shame, but nobody wants to do that because they want to get along. And unfortunately, oftentimes that is exposing where people have fallen down is the only way to get action. So for example, I bring up Reality Winner a lot, the Air Force, um, Air Force veteran and NSA contractor, she was just 28, and she's the one who released the NSA report showing that Russia's attack on our election infrastructure, A, was real, um, the media reports were real, and B, it was more pervasive than public had been led to believe. And state officials said that they would not, for some of them, this was the first they had heard that Russia was behind the attack. That's another example of a lack of transparency. They were not even told that key, that piece of it, which makes it just much more real, I think. And apparently it was Mitch McConnell who refused to sign a bipartisan letter to the um, to all of the state election officials if it said that it was Russia. And the letter also didn't even mention that Russians were in a position to change vote tallies in some places, which I think is inexcusable. It should have at least mentioned that. But um, in any event, uh, I forget where I was going with this, but we do need transparency. She, she was a transparency warrior on this issue, and for that she received the longest sentence ever under the Espionage Act, and she's still in prison and we should really celebrate her I think as the hero she did what she did was illegal but sometimes doing that's civil disobedience sometimes it's necessary for the greater good and to say she took one for the team would be the understatement of the century um, I've got a project by the way to promote Columbus Institute of Contemporary Journalism uh, they at the columbusfreepress.com you can read about it they have sent out requests to every single county and every single battleground state asking for information such as who, who specifically, like their name and where they work and contact information is programming every aspect of their electronic um, voting system. 
that seems like such a such a reasonable thing to know but when you scale it up to the size of the entire country and how individualized everybody's different voting things is that's got to be so many names and that's got to be quite the undertaking Right. And I mean, they're relying to an extent on people's goodwill in providing the information, but they also can do some of it through public records requests. And I think the idea is that right now there's just no, because there's no transparency, there's no accountability. And um, if things go wrong, we need to be able to follow up in a meaningful way. And our, unfortunately, our elected representatives, I know they've got their hand, hands full, but they have really fallen down on the job. The Democrats in particular, my party, in terms of following up when there are sort of suspicious election, when the Democrats have suspicious election losses. So Hillary losing, um, you know, she didn't follow up and uh, it, it, it's, we never do, you know, the floor in the midterms, uh, Nelson, uh, Nelson and Gillum didn't, didn't follow up particularly on, maybe there was a recount actually in one of them. They didn't fight as hard as they could have in any event and we need to change that culture. I think that there's a tendency to want it to, to of candidates to want to promote truth in the um, confidence in the election system, trust in the election system, even if that particular outcome is untrustworthy. And we need to kind of get over that. That you know, it doesn't mean the entire system is broken if one race, if somebody cheats in a race. But we need to at least be not night not so naive that we don't even consider the possibility that there might have been cheating and we don't even let ourselves look to make to, you know cross our t's and dot our i's we have to at least do some basic due diligence so we're not just run right over i hear you and it's not even unfortunately a new problem i mean if we look back at the 2000 election that everybody is talking about with bush v gore uh, especially with this this sham of a SCOTUS nomination, um, it really comes into focus, doesn't it? It's a little, it's not that complicated. It's hard to get it just into a couple of sound bites, but this is how I usually talk about it. So ESNS is America's largest voting machine vendor currently, and it has also been for a very long time. It, as of 2017, according to the Wharton Business School, it accounts for 44% of US election equipment. In, uh, one of its, it was founded by two brothers, Bob and Todd Urosevich. One of those two brothers, Bob Urosevich, moved to another company just, uh, well, he, he became president of another company called Global Election Systems before the 20, 20, 2000 election, sorry. So in about, he was made president sometime around September of 2000, or maybe it was even July 2000. And Global bought a company from a convicted embezzler named Jeffrey Dean, whose crimes involved sophisticated computer tampering. And they made him the, he became the largest shareholder of global election systems just before the 2000 election. And he even brought in his, one of his friends from prison who was a convicted drug trafficker. And some of the concerns there, well, obviously the crimes of Jeffrey Dean involved computer tampering. And then um, with the, his friend, just you, you worry about compromise because I think they probably had financial woes coming out of prison and you worry about that sort of thing. So these were the people that he was put in charge, his friend was put in charge of punch cards, Dean was in charge of the voting machine security or programming. And um, then in 2002, uh, Diebold Inc., an ATM manufacturer who's CEO was a big, big George Bush supporter. They bought global election systems, but they had been in negotiations with them during the entire preceding year when this embezzler came in and all of that. And they told the media that when they were asked because Bev Harris had, had talked about the embezzler at Diebold and, and alerted the media, they claimed that he was no longer with the company. But then she found records either from a deposition or from internal company memos that show he became, they just made him a consultant. So he was off the... You know, he wasn't on as a, an employee or a shareholder, but now he was some sort of a consultant. And so we don't really know for how long he consulted for Diebold, but, um, but yeah, that's the history. And then they, Diebold, I'm sorry, ESNS went ahead and bought Diebold in 2009. And again, the two companies were related all along because you had the brother at ESNS and the other brother at Diebold. And then Chuck Schumer alerted the Department of Justice because the combined company was 70% of US election equipment and they broke it up. 
they sold some of Diebold's assets, like its intellectual property rights and some of its warehouse equipment to Dominion Voting in Canada, which was before that was just, no one really knew of them in the US. So they became America's second largest vendor. And then ESNS kept most of the Diebold servicing and maintenance and operation contracts. And so they're still the largest. And, and here we are today. Uh, number one and number two combined those two two vendors ESNS and Dominion account for over eighty percent of U.S. election equipment. That is incredible. Not just the history and the well, let's just say it criminal past of the company, but the fact that it, it it's basically the electorate, right? It's the whole entire election um, nationwide. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Again, I don't know that the, I don't think the embezzler is actually, that particular embezzler anyway is still involved in our elections. I've heard through the grapevine that he's probably not. He's on some, has some mansion on a hilltop somewhere and I forgot where. But um, it's, it's disturbing because you just assume that somebody is vetting the vendors and what it shows is that nobody has been. And the only person who found it was not, it wasn't the, our elected representatives who dug into this and found it. It was an election integrity activist. Um, Bev Harris, who had to sound the alarm. And even the media really dropped the ball. So like 60 Minutes knew about it. They had the whole story. They had, you know, the copy of the indictment. It's not disputable. It's not disputed. It's not disputable. But they decided not to tell the public. I think, I don't know why. I guess because it doesn't prove cheating. And I agree, it doesn't prove cheating. But it it certainly shows no one is betting. I hear you. And honestly, I'm, I'm going to make a logical jump that... <laughs> that if you have Republicans in Congress blocking election integrity, election security bills, I'm wondering if they might know what to hide. <laughs> the call out to our show's listeners, the activism, the activism is the key. And I'm so glad that you said that, Jenny, because I, I'm recently activated, sure, but my eyes are wide open and I'm starting to see that it really is going to take all of us every day participating in this democracy to keep it a democracy. Audit USA, and they do, they're working mostly, well, actually they work on many things. One of their projects is ballot image audits where they, a lot of scanners in the country, most of them actually, automatically take a picture, a digital image of your ballot as it's scanned through. And if those were made public, we the public could get them and compare them against the official totals. He works on that. Unfortunately, a lot of election officials destroy them, but he has been fighting for several for years now to have them not destroy them. And he's made some progress. But I wanted to also say he goes, I mean, he's gone in person to many of these problem counties and he gets information. So he and a few other activists were the first to report that um, Wisconsin, I think it was when they reported in December 2016, when everyone was saying the voting machines don't connect to the internet, they reported for who, they got the story, and report, it was who at why that reported it, but these activists got it, that they were modeming their results. And that meant that it connecting the scanners to the internet. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And it's so, um, again, another personal story. I, <laughs> I won't say that I was thrilled with Jill Stein and, you know, get that right. Uh, but I did participate in the recounts because something just seemed off. Um, and I can tell you that I was a uh, part of the boots on the ground in Wisconsin, and we were actually taking pictures. Um, so there's this tamper seal on all the machines. Um, and if it's broken, they basically say, hey, there's a problem here. Um, and we did find machines where that seal had been tampered with. Yeah. And you know, what's really disturbing, though, in this back to our broken and non-transparent system. So in Michigan, to the extent they did a recount, they excluded excluded from their recount places where the machines had broken seals and they excluded from that's how Michigan law reads and they excluded from the recount precincts where the number of voters and the number of voters and the number of votes didn't match and you know, those would of course be the ones where you might think you should include them and then they shut it down after three days anyway so yeah we need we need all eyes and ears on the ground and um, yeah, it's going to take all of us. It really is. And we have to really pay attention to those down ballot races because it isn't, I mean, we could get Trump out of office and still be in a world of hurt if, um, you know, for example, if they are able, if they win all the state legislatures and they're able to gerrymander the maps again, because that'll be the next 10 years of it, which largely determines control of the House of Representatives. So 
You're exactly right. I am so sorry. I I meant to um, ask you a quick question because of your legal background, um, which I definitely don't have and want to take advantage of while I have you on the show. Um, Is there a legal way forward, do you think, for the American people to redress the system and to say that, yeah, we want an audit? I don't care what the campaign is doing. It's me as a voter. I'm just curious. So it's Maybe, but I think what we do is if we raise enough public awareness about that the systems actually can be gamed, it, it, it sets the type of framework where we could get a re, where we could maybe persuade the candidates or, or persuade enough people to tell the candidates that they don't want them to roll over if they are more suspicious. I hear you. Well, I'm going to do my part by making sure that every single person on my Twitter feed knows about our show today, oh, knows terrific. about the organizations that you told us about, and especially, especially this one really just stuck out to me, volunteering to take uh, pictures of the elections results totals. That seems huge. (laughs) Yes, yes, I think it is. So fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. It is my pleasure. I am so glad that we were able to get you on the show. And Like I said, um, don't be surprised if we come back again and say, okay, we need to talk to Jenny. She's she's the one to see on this issue. (laughs) Anytime. That would be fantastic. Wonderful, Jenny. Thank you so much. Okay, you too. Have a great afternoon or evening. I'm someone who never thought I would ever run for Congress. I'm running for this seat because change has to happen. I'm running because my son's life matters. My daughter, her life matters. And it's time for St. Louis to grow and to prosper. And that prosperity has to be felt by all St. Louisans. We will have an amazing St. Louis. You deserve it. I'm Corey Bush, and I approve this message. All right, I'm not as terrified of um, voting, but I'm always going to make sure that it is on a paper ballot now after talking to Jennifer. What about you, Aaron? I hear you. And honestly, after we've heard of how certain states, mine included y'all in Illinois, is too late to remove the modems, um, I I really am glad that she's continuing to do the work on auditing because it really looks like this election, especially this election, is going to have to be audited in every single state across the nation. Yes, if you are able to go volunteer, go sign up, some places pay, go be a a, a, a poll judge and then be one of the post audit people who are going to help review manually all of these votes because it's it's you know it's never been more important to make sure that we got all of those votes counted. Um, especially, you know, gosh, as across the country, we are seeing reports of Democratic governors being plotted against for kidnapping, which is terrifying. That's what we're going to dedicate the last little part of our show here to this week is the, you know, rumors of kidnapping of governors because it's 2020. That's what's happening. It, it's absolutely ridiculous, Vince. And honestly, I heard a report that it was even worse. They planned to just shoot her if she opened the door when they rang at her residence. Uh, today, out in the news, <laughs> there's actually reports that it wasn't just Governor Whitmer. Um, and thank God that nothing happened to Gretchen. I think she's an amazing woman. And this plot was disgusting. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also been revealed that they're, they, they were part of the same plot to also kidnap and potentially harm Governor Northam in Virginia. So, guys, it's starting to feel pretty coordinated. And I'm not going to name names just yet, but coordination takes a lot of people to organize. I'm just saying. You know, and it's and it's and it's we have to remember to call these plots what they are. We have to remember to use the correct terminology. Um, it's it, it's amazing to see how mainstream media and and independent journalists and freelance reporters and writers all kind of migrate towards using the same language, reactionary to one another. When we saw the plot uh, to kidnap Governor Whitmer, or worse and worse even, um, unfold, we saw the uh, the evolution of the language go. And um, friend of the show Tahi Chappelle was on, on Twitter talking about this, amongst many other people, um, about you know what whether we call these terrorist organization militia groups, which is a constitutional term, or whether or not we are uh, whether or not they're they're lone independent lone wolf organizations, or if they are being coordinated by some kind of a back or- organization or shadow government. Um, all of it is 
kind of terrifying for sure. Um, I hear you, Vince, and I'm always, as always, going to blurt out the thing that nobody thought about political expediency before creating it. I'm going to call them white ISIS, okay? Because apparently that's the only way it's going to get any kind of attention. The FBI has been banging the drum for decades, not a couple of years, not since Trump was elected, for decades about domestic terrorism. And for those of you who haven't broken the code yet, that's called white supremacy. You know, through the history of our nation, absolutely all forms of domestic terrorism have been to uphold white supremacy. And uh, I'm just thinking back to, you know, that beacon of hope and in, 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 in everybody's, uh, you know, every left of liberal person's favorite uh, place, West Wing, the show, uh, when they dedicated an entire season two, uh, to to the idea of the federal government having to eradicate uh, white nationalist organizations and having to focus on whether or not it's lone wolf operatives or coordinated people. And this is a conversation that we've been backburnering for for far too long in this country. And we are in this moment of of, of another wave of great movement for civil rights and for black lives. and, and, And we need to recognize the very real threat that is mounting against everybody who would otherwise be see themselves as 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 you know a non-racist or an anti-racist american that's exactly right vince and i am proud to call myself an anti-racist in every way in every teaching that i give my son um i i seek to be more and more of an anti-racist of a promoter of anti-racism of breaking the systemic racism that our country has seen and i want to give a shout out to something i saw on twitter no i'm not going to call you out because that's not what the show is but i did see someone who said that they couldn't believe that this was the republican party that racism had infiltrated the republican party I'm sorry to wake you guys up or or beat a drum, but this this is not new. We have had quiet racism before. If you've heard the terms law and order, urban crime, urban voting, uh, those are all code and they're code for racism. Yes, they are. Those beautiful little uh, dog whistles that they uh, that they love to permeate throughout our culture. Um, and you know what, this transitions really, really well into um, a little bit of our, our, our accountability list and what we're doing to, um, to keep ourselves active and to advance progressive politics and policy this week. Um, next week, our guest is gonna be Hashim Coates, who is a Denver-based uh, activist and community member and, and, and Democratic volunteer. In fact, um, this year he is Colorado's Democratic Party Volunteer of the Year. And, um, and I'm traveling with him to Washington, D.C. Uh, amongst the, uh, the, the larger delegation, both to stand against the Republican Party uh, uh, nominating a, a Supreme Court justice two weeks before a federal election while people are already casting their ballots, but also to take place in a couple of actions and movements for black lives. And, um, and, and, and he's going to be coming on the show to, to reflect on how to take it out of the streets, take it out of the anger, take it out of the emotion, and how to put it um, really into actual actionable steps with us next week. And I'm really excited. Absolutely. I can't wait to talk with him as well. And he, he just, just as all of the guests on our show, really, you guys, uh, the timing could not be more perfect because... I want to talk with him about how we're going to face the white supremacist threat around the country. I want to hear about how we can help raise our um, friends and families of color, how we can fight for their voices, for their equal rights, for their voting privileges that every American has fought and died to protect. Every vote counts. Every voice counts. And I can't wait to, as well, talk with him about how we're going to reframe this argument around the Supreme Court. I'm just going to say it, Vince. I'm sick and tired of Democrats, both left, middle, and, and you know, new Republican light Democrats, <laughs> taking on GOP labels. We are not packing the court. We are not having a conversation about packing the court. What we are doing, and I'm going to give a shout out to Jason Overstreet now, who very, very wisely said, it's time that we heal the court. 
healing the court, rebalancing the court. There's so many wonderful, wonderful ideas that definitely need to be given the light of day and discussed out loud, and we cannot shove down into dark holes and refuse to talk about. Um, and we can't give ourselves over to the GOP talking points of refusing to discuss it because nothing advances a conservative uh, mindset like refusing to discuss something new. Um, so that's how I am staying and keeping myself accountable and active this week is is traveling and fighting against the uh, the, the Republican takeover of our of our Supreme Court. Um, how about you, Aaron? What's keeping you busy right now? So in addition to calling senators and telling them what we want to see on the Supreme Court fight, and by the way, if you have a Republican senator, you can tell them how disgusted you are with how their hypocrisy is ignoring what the people say. It is 70 plus percent of the country, you guys, that wants them to wait until the inauguration of the next president. Just saying. And if you're like me and you're blessed with the Democratic senators, I'm sorry. Our work still isn't done because you know what? I'm tired of hearing words. Let's see some action. What are your plans to stop this? What are your plans to halt what's happening? In the words of Elizabeth Warren, it's a sham and it shouldn't be occurring. It definitely should not be occurring And anything that Senator Warren says. You know that we are going to absolutely take to heart here on a plan for that because we are born from the Warren Democrats and we are building a plan out of this Republican hellhole that we found for a progressive future every single week right here on this show. That's exactly right, Vince. And I don't want to get into too many different topics, but since it's pre-election, I also want to shout out the Working Families Party. They have come up with a beautiful people's charter. If you look at all the things they're fighting for to hold the Biden-Harris administration accountable, it is literally everything Elizabeth Warren ran on. It is literally everything that we are all looking for. Yeah, post-election, we're going to have a very real conversation about uh, the plans for that working families party because it could be so much more than a tiny democratic coalition but make sure you hit subscribe wherever you are listening to this to make sure that you do not miss it you can help this show out by you know dropping a review making sure that five of your friends who would be interested in hearing it know about it you know dm it to them text it to them copy that link and send it over because we can't build this progressive wave without you we can't build the army of progressives without your recruiting help Absolutely right. And it's also a very good friend of the show, Operation Frederick Douglass today, who released the most beautiful ad talking about the hypocrisy of the SCOTUS hearing for Amy Coney Barrett. Y'all, I'm going to be hyping that over my personal Twitter account, and I know that the show will be doing the same. Absolutely. We you know we will. Keep in touch with us at Plan for That Pod for the show. I am at Vinny Chant on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, go follow me on Instagram because I'm trying to make a career as a cannabis influencer right now, apparently, and I need your likes. It sounds great, Vince. I love it, and I know our listeners do, too. <laughs> Awesome. See everybody next week. Thank you for joining us on A Plan for That. More fun, more plans, more power. <laughs>